Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. Sunday chat today. A um, little bit different because the membership's up and running and I want to do that first. So, um, big thank you to those that have become members. Um, I'm a little surprised, I must admit. And one of the things I said I would do is as people become new members, we will read them out. So in the order they joined, <laughs> we've got Eric Kate, Chris Schmitz, Naomi Mitchell, uh, Stetterfire, John Wilson, Ned Flynn, Monica Gabby, or Gabay, Gail Cunningham, Barbara Buddleman, I think that says. That's my writing, not your name. <laughs> uh, Stevie White, Trisha L and Wanda Shaw. Now remember those are not necessarily people's actual names, those are their channel names because that's all I can see. So thanks to those 12, you are the forerunners, you are the new people and um, greatly appreciated that you can effectively make a hopefully long-term donation on a monthly basis which is what the membership's all about. Just quickly, I've set up three um, levels of membership. There is a basic level, um, which basically is a, a you know a, a small donation to the channel for the upkeep of the orchids, getting new orchids and things like that. The noise you can hear in the background is the nice new shed that I mentioned. Turns out to not be a shed; it's a kids' playroom and it looks like the whole neighbourhood are getting invited um, out of the wind, dry, you know, sort of makes sense, unsupervised, <laughs> somebody will get hurt. Um, anyway, so that's what the noise is in the background. Um, weekdays that won't be a problem obviously because kids will be at school but um, certainly at weekends the noise level might be a bit I might have to film a bit earlier in the day or something, if it gets bad, we shall see. I mean, better weather, kids will play outside, won't they? They won't be shut in a shed, or I wouldn't, anyway. Anyway, so the three levels of membership, there is a basic membership for a relatively low fee on a monthly basis. Um, you get badge against your comments, that's working, we've tried that out, that seems to work. So when you leave a comment on a video, you get like a little medal alongside your name to the right hand side to show you're a member, makes you stand out a bit. And um, you get your shout out. The next level up gets um, members only videos, which I will do now and again. And part of the content of those videos will be... Um, like a vote on which video to do next and things like that. So I will try and make those more interactive for that level of membership. And um, the high level membership, the most expensive one, <laughs> includes everything so far, but it will include um, that level of membership, live broadcasts and chats. So they'll be, they'll be very interactive but I can't do those until I've got sufficient members to make it worthwhile. So that may take a while to get that up and running. Um, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, thanks again for those who've become a member to support the channel. And also thanks to Hannah for suggesting it because I didn't give it a thought. So good stuff. Right, that's that out of the way. Um, general news, the sticks in the car have gone. <laughs> That was fun. I went to the tip on a weekday and it was busy. I had to park a reasonable distance from the actual staircase up to the top of the skip. I wanted to put the sticks in. So it was taking me quite a long time. And all of a sudden this big burly guy with a huge big pair of gloves came along. Do you want a hand, mate? <laughs> I said, oh, thank you very much. I looked round and he had most of it in, in one armful. I'm surprised he didn't get spiked with that pipe pyrocanther. But anyway, uh, I, I had some help to unload the car. Um, now I've got another couple of trips up the tip to do with the bags of rubbish, the stuff that was bagged up, most, mostly by Hannah, but some of my stuff in there as well. So that's got to go around the tip. It won't all go in the car at once, so we'll do one lot and get rid of most of it, and then take the second lot plus all the old tins of paint that will free up some more space in the shed. So uh, good stuff. And... Um, 
Yeah, I think this is going to get a, a bit noisy, this, what's going on out here. Unfortunately, the, the dad of the house the shed is in, or the flat that the shed is in, is one of these gobby, everything has to be volume 10. I can hear him on the phone inside his flat with the window shut, in my house. <laughs> Still, takes all sorts. Um, right, so that's, yeah, what's going on. And once I've got the um, carport cleared, I'll be able to get on and coat up the next lot of bonsai staging, because that's going to spread the trees out. Now we're getting some sun in the garden. You might be able to see through the door there. The trees in their new position do actually catch the sun for an hour or so. That will increase as time goes on. So um, getting the second lot of staging done, because some of the trees I don't really want in the sun to any great extent, not as it gets stronger. So uh, that's the uh, sort of outside stuff. <clears throat> um, inside, the longer term plan for what's going on in here is that I'm currently running my night thermostatic temperature at 15 degrees C. That's gone up from 13 because I, I had a feeling that was contributing to plant loss and new growths not doing so well. So that's gone up to 15 and then I forced the daytime temperature up to 18 um, by changing the thermostat around 9 o'clock in the morning and then as it starts to go dark I take it back down to 15. So that's what's happening now and as a consequence of the heater being on more that dries the air so Hurricane Hector's activated and keeps the humidity up. Not to a high level. We're only, we're only working at sort of 65, 70 percent. I don't at these lower temperatures. I don't need the humidity that high. Um, so that's that. And then as we get towards the end of February, I will up the daytime one degree every week until I get up to sort of 20, 21. And what I'm hoping is that that will coincide with the increase in day lengths, the rate of increases will be quite high, so the day lengths will be noticeably increasing as the temperature increases, artificially controlled by me, I'm hoping to push things into growth to actually trigger that new growth and once it starts and gets going the temperatures won't matter so much. <laughs> it's just to get things started because a lot of my dendrobium canes are short and um, you know, the other, other growths were stunted because of the lower temperatures, so I'm hoping to get things going a bit better. That's that. Right, now the rest of today, I thought we'd have a look at and a chat about Oncidium types. Now this, um, Oncidiums are probably guilty of more intergeneric combinations than any other genus, quite honestly. I mean, we've got pure Oncidiums, but um, many contributions to intergenerics that can end up with quite a large variety but the actual growing conditions, the care as such, does vary but it's not dramatic. It's not really dramatic. Um, so first of all we have what can go in an intergeneric then? Well, we've got the old-fashioned odontoglossums, but most of those are now called, on, uh, called oncidiums. Um, Cochleodas, another cool, cool grower. Brassias. Um, Ada, which is a, a very close relative to the Brassias, and the combination of those is Brass Ada. Um, well, well, there's others. <laughs> And then there's that generic term called Cambria, which basically means I can't even be bothered to find an intergeneric that works, I'll just call it Cambria. There's Oncostelles, um, that's an Oncidium mixed with a Rhinecostelli, which, you know, you don't hear of them very often, do you? <laughs> but all these intergenerics, basically I just call Oncidium types. And the main variable is size, and the temperature range. There are very few deep shade loving Oncidium types. Most of them are medium to higher light, some higher than others. Um, so their light doesn't vary that much. 
to, a, uh, to any great extent. Um, their temperature range does go from cool to warm and some of them need cool and some of them need warm. Most are in the middle, down the middle, the intermediate sort of uh, thing and they'll be fine. Um, many, especially in the intergenerics, are quite tolerant of not being in the right conditions. They'll put up with quite a lot. Again, that's interbreeding to get stronger um, more resilient plants than species that can be quite delicate and sometimes quite difficult to grow um, unless those conditions are you know they've got a very narrow um, comfort zone so if you're not in it and you're outside of it they don't do so well and some of them can take a long time to go down they can take two or three years to die <laughs> even though they started when you brought them home uh, right um, so Variables in size, um, from considerably small to pretty large. We'll have a look at a few. I'm not getting loads of different ones out, but I will get some. And kick the camera as I go past. Now this is a species. This is um, Cheriforum. This is what I would call a miniature. Miniature Oncidium. Um, and very rarely grows into anything big. And what I mean by that is it drops its leaves sooner than a lot of others, meaning that you've got leafless bulbs on the plant. And you'll have leaves on the previous year's growths and leaves on the current year's growths. Any growths older than that will probably drop their leaves. So you end up with quite a lot of naked bulbs basically with no leaves on. I mean this is cut this is currently pushing up one new growth and um, the last one matured and bloomed. This did have a few flower spikes on not that long ago so that's what I would call a miniature. Then we get up the other end of the scale. I, <coughs> this one happens to be handy. Um, this is more of a monster in comparison you know, what you're looking at here is, is very, very large, fat pseudobulbs. In the Oncidium Alliance, that's probably about as big as you're going to get. You might get some bulbs bigger than that, but not very often. This is at the larger end. This is, in fact, a Shari Baby, but this is, um, this is a redone Shari Baby that started going around a couple of years ago. And it's virtually twice the size of the previous um, crosses called Shari Baby and this one really is a monster I mean it may well be a 2N or a 4N and don't ask me what that means because I don't really know I just know that a, a cross that's got 2N after its name is going to be more vigorous and more sturdy and stronger with bigger flowers and more of them um, and the 4N even more so so this is currently pushing up some new growths. It's got mature growths. This has got mature growths that didn't bloom. And I can remember once, long time ago, in my um, early days, I had a plant that, that looked like this, big and strong and healthy, good root system, nice green leaves. Everything looked good, and no blooms. And I, I took it into, I think I took it into Bournemouth Orchid Society, and I said, why hasn't this bloomed? I said, it's got, it's got reasonable light, you know, so it's not short on light, um, it gets fed, um, you can see it's a strong, healthy plant. And the guy just looked at me and said, it's too healthy, it doesn't need to bloom. And he said, that happens to some orchids where they're so happy and contented, they have no reason to perpetuate, which is what the blooming's all about. And he said the other end of the scale is you will get a weak, wishy-washy plant that's almost dead that will push up a bloom spike. And that's a desperation blooming. <laughs> that's its last ditch attempt to perpetuate itself. But um, it has been known that orchids can be too healthy to bloom. Not so sure about that myself. But uh, anyway, that's up the bigger end. Uh, so that's that. And then there's everything in between. And um, you will get oddities, like um, this one that's not doing very well at all, but I'm hoping to bring this on next year. This is this, um, oh, 
can't remember how to say it, Guise Brechiana, I think it is, or something like that. Um, it's a Mexicoa, and um, it comes from Mexico, and it comes from dry oak forests. And when the oak forests, uh, a lot of them are deciduous, not all of them, some of them are evergreen, um, during that phase there is hardly any rain at all. It really is an arid area for three or four months of the year. So that's what this is getting now. <laughs> it's getting next to no water. It is quite shriveled, um, but I'm hoping to pull this one on next year. Um, we shall see. But that again would be classed as a miniature. So, um, so they do vary a lot. Right, the temperature range variable. Where did I put it? Come on. My unicorn juice. Um, at the lower end of the temperature range, you've got odontoglossums and similar. I think Cochleodas are cool growers as well. These are cool growing montane forest plants. So they do not like high light and they don't like heat. And I'd say across the board with Oncidiums, go careful with your airflow. They're not too keen on getting blasted with airflow. Um, their leaves are very fine in a lot of cases, very thin, they're not much, they're not much more than a cell thick. And, and as a consequence, they can lose moisture very quickly. Generally speaking, you blast them with airflow that's too heavy and you're almost sucking the moisture out of those leaves. And unless you've got an excellent root system and plenty of moisture at the base, they can't replenish it. So the leaves dry. Um, it can cause quite a lot of damage. That hatch making an awful lot of noise, that's its alarm call. <laughs> it's probably somebody else on the bird feeder when he wanted to be there, he or she or it. Um, yes, so you've got the cooler end, and those do like to stay reasonably cool. What do I mean by reasonably cool? Um, well, my sort of night temperatures are fine. They can go down lower than that, but you've got to go careful. If you go too low, although the plant may put up with it, they are more prone to rots and moulds and things. And so you think, oh, well, I'll up the airflow then. Well, you provide quite a bit of airflow in cooler temperatures. It's called a draft. <laughs> it's not called airflow anymore. It's called a draft. And they're not going to like that one little bit. So I always sort of think along the cool growing oncidium types. If you need airflow, put it around the plants, not at them. Yeah, an oscillating fan is pretty good because it never stays in one place long, that's not bad. But again, don't have the plants right in front of it, it's a blast. It needs to, if you can see the leaves moving, it's too much. If they do that now and again, that's about okay. Um, so go steady on your airflow. Um, humidity, all of them like reasonable humidity, some like quite high humidity they'll be the cloud forest ones specifically they like higher humidity so uh, there we go but remember your humidity level is relative to your temperatures if you're talking about the low um, low temperature types humidity is naturally measured at a higher rate so don't go too mad you know if you're working at 10 to 12 degrees c and you've got 95 percent humidity it sounds good doesn't it uh, it's probably not going to work. <laughs> uh, go steady. And then up the, um, the medium end is most. Most of will, will fit into the intermediate temperature range. So, you know, a minimum of sort of 12 to 15 is okay. I, I've gone to the 15 end rather than the 12. Um, but what is important with all of them, and you could say this across the board with virtually all orchids, is to make sure you've got a difference between day and night. They need that. It, 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 it's part of their metabolism. They need that. How many places in the world can you think of, apart from where you've got white stuff under your feet, <laughs> are the daytime temperatures the same as the nighttime temperatures? Um, you know, in the warmer countries, you'd never get any sleep, would you? <laughs> So that is a natural thing, and, and it's the thing that lets us down growing in the home, is, is that 
inability to give them that differential and it is quite important to plants. Some plants just won't grow very well without it. Some plants don't bloom without it. It's part of their trigger mechanism to form buds or spikes. So it's quite important to have that differential. And I would say that a, a minimum of three degrees differential and it would be better if it was four or five. Um, and during the growing season, it needs to be quite a bit more, quite honestly. The bigger, the better, <laughs> without dropping below the required minimum. Um, I was looking at some temperatures for Myanmar, um, and it, they vary. You've got quite high mountainous ranges, and then you've got, you know, low tropical forest areas. You've got really heavy rainforests. And all this is in one country. So when you say, oh, it comes from Myanmar, therefore it needs this. No, you can't do that. Um, it varies too much. You know, you, you've got mountainous areas where they're virtually white across the top throughout the year. No orchids up there, that's for sure. Um, so the elevation makes a hell of a difference. And the rainfall makes a hell of a difference. I had a look at some maps. And if you have a look at the map of the world and look at rainfall, you get a dark band right across the middle. So that's like most of South America from halfway up to the top into Mexico, that lot. And then coming across, you've got a big band across Central Africa. Um, <laughs> if it wasn't a desert at the top, it would probably include a bit of that. Then you've got Madagascar's included, and then coming across, you've got parts of India, you know, and the, the Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, across into the southern China, and northern Australia, and all those islands. They get the rain, highest rainfalls. And then you find another map of the world, and have a look at the temperatures. And it's almost a one for one. So where all that heavy rain is, that's also where it's warmest. There's some logic there. <laughs> But that rain isn't there all year round in all of those places. There is always a period of less rain. I won't say no rain, I never do. Um, right, so yeah, um, where does the genus come from um, on Sidiums? Well, you're looking at uh, the Americas, mostly sort of Brazil, um, Peru, that area. And some are from cloud forests, and that's the bit you need to know. It's, it's those differences, uh, you know, like that um, one that I mentioned that comes from those oak forests in Mexico. That's a unique habitat. You're not going to find that anywhere else. So some of the orchids that are found there are only found there. Some of them are only found on a couple of hillsides, and that's it. That's your lot. Very fragile communities. Those. It only needs somebody to go in with a group of collectors, they could wipe them out, just like that. Just take every one. Um, so, yeah. Light-wise, on Sidiums, you've got the low-light ones. They tend to be the cooler ones, but not always. Go steady. <laughs> um, but the Odonts and Cochleodas would prefer to stay cool and at lower light levels than some of the others. When you get up the other end, like the Brassias, they need good light. Um, I won't say strong cattleya light, but not far off. And they would possibly need to be acclimatised to more light gently. Um, because when you bring them home, where they come from, um, they might have got used to less light. And if you suddenly put them in bright light, you can burn the leaves. Those leaves are quite thin compared with some other orchids. Um, yeah, um, I think the Oncidium Alliance and the group of Oncidiums, even in the middle of here, you can get a cat hair. <laughs> Where did that come from? Uh, um, anyway, I think they are very rewarding. Um, and what I like is the difference. When you look at the um, Twinkles, for instance, they have a bloom shape that is found in quite a few species as well. And it's very distinctive. There aren't any other orchids look like that. But then you go into the odontoglossums and, you know, have a look at something like um, the original odontoglossum crispum that's now called Oncidium 
Alexandre, I think it is. Not here, it's not. <laughs> um, but if you look at the odontoglossums, they're a very different shape. Quite different. <coughs> Quite different. And then have a look at a brassia, the spider orchids. Totally different again. So within that set of plants, you have a hell of a variety of bloom shapes, sizes, fragrances, and all the colours, except blue, I think. <laughs> There's any blues. There's very few real blue orchids anyway. There's purple heading towards blue is what is often called blue, like the Victoria Regina that I've got. It's not really blue, but it's as near as you're going to get. In Australia, there are some terrestrials that are true blue. Um, really, like smashing blue, but it's rare in the um, it's rare in the plant world, really. So uh, yeah, in the Oncidium Alliance, you've got probably the biggest variety in bloom size and shape and colour and fragrance. There are a few in there that are a bit like, oh, what is that? <laughs> and there are others that are heady, sickly. Um, fill a room. I mean, Shari Baby in its ideal world will, you know, so it's like somebody's actually got a liquid chocolate on the go. Um, very strong fragrance. So uh, it's a genus that's well worth looking into, or a set of genera, quite honestly, or genera, um, because there's such a variety and there's something for everybody in there. There's got to be, you know, from plant size, well, I haven't got much room. Well, there's miniatures. You know, the twinkles are an ideal candidate. Pretty easy to grow, pretty tolerant of um, the variables, and don't grow that big. But they can have very long spikes, and they can take a very long time to grow those spikes and open the buds. <laughs> so not for the impatient. Yeah. So there we go. I mean, I've, um, I've got quite a few and a variety. I've got some species in amongst there. I've got some odonts. I've got right up to brassias. So I've got the light range, I've got the temperature range, and um, yeah, I'm hoping that um, a lot of those are going to get repotted because they had the cocoa husk put in the media and I want to get that out and replace it. Um, right, stuff to come um, this week. Obviously, one a week, we will have another um, 2023 Project Orchids video. This one's going to be a bit different, I'll give you a warning. One plant, no names mentioned, has not made it, despite quite an effort to actually pull it through. It hasn't made it. And that was one of our Project Orchids. It's now gone. So it's not even going to make its first video. So um, that means the one that was ninth now becomes eighth and becomes a member of the set. But because of what the plant that's been lost, um, I have another plant that I want to do a similar thing with. So that will be this week's video because I want to get on with that. And I will film the plant that's been lost just to show you what it looks like as part of this week's video, even though it's no longer a Project Orchid. <laughs> it's a brown bread orchid, basically. It's got its own set, all of its own. Well, there's, there's a few others are dying to get in that set, I think. <laughs> no pun intended. Actually, the pun was intended. It was just not planned. Um, yeah, so we'll have a Project Orchid video. I've got repotting to do. And one of the videos, um, because it'll be unusual, shall we say, Derek's orchids, of which there are, I think there's about 14 or 15 left out of the 20 I started with, and there's some rare orchids still in there. Some of the ones I've lost, unfortunately, were incredibly rare. Um, but I'm going to repot all of them in one go, and it's going to be the fastest repotting you've ever seen, because it won't be a full-blown repot. It'll almost be a media replacement, but I'm going to do that, hopefully, this week. But the... Um, the problem with working and filming out here is working in between the hot box because I want to keep that going for at least another couple of weeks to keep the intensity of that, um, those sulphur vapours in here to try and dispose of everything that's got legs out here apart from me and the cats 
um, and dispose of the lot by the intensity and the frequency so that as we do get to the warmer temperatures and everything there's nothing left lurking to suddenly activate. That's my theory anyway. It may or may not work. This is a new idea. So that's that. Um, next weekend on Saturday, I'm off to the Mathers Foundation. So I, I will be filming on Saturday, but I won't be here. Now that will produce hopefully some videos that will be of interest because they are a Cymbidium Odontoglossum Specialist and more recently Miltoniopsis and Pleonis. Uh, I haven't got much interest in those, those are terrestrials. They're like bulbs, well they are bulbs basically. Um, you put them in a pot and they produce beautiful flowers prior to the leaves coming out. So that they are, if, if you like them then you really will like them. Um, and they're actually quite easy to grow I believe, I've never tried. But, um, but they're small for the size of the bulb the blooms are huge, quite honestly, and they've inherited a private collection that was collected over many, many years with a lot of hybrids and breeding going on to produce some colours that you would not normally see in amongst the actual species. So, anyway, so I shall be on going on the tour and um, then we'll, we'll be allowed to film, basically. So I should get some nice films of some... Some orchids that don't exist anywhere else in the world apart from in those glass houses because they've been bred there, yeah? There are some like that. Although they've only been going a short time, they've in they inherited some from somewhere else that no longer has them because they have them, if you see what I mean. So uh, we'll have that to come. That'll be Saturday. Um, <sighs> I'm not sure what time I'll get back, whether I'd get back in time to put something together to actually post on Saturday. Um, so it might be the following week before you get to see the videos, because obviously the Sunday will be the Sunday chat. Um, and hopefully as many people as possible will watch the Project Orchids. I think the theory of doing one plant in each video and repeating that at the same time every two months is going to work better than having multiple plants where somebody might have a bit of an interest in one of them but not much interest in the others so they just don't watch if you see what I mean. Now obviously if it's a plant that people aren't interested in then perhaps I'm cutting my own throat because if it's something they can't grow or don't have no interest in then they just won't watch it. But then you all helped choose the plant, so in theory there is something for everybody, even if it's not every single Project Horsey or Good Video. So, uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, yeah, there's not much else. I mean, it is a quiet time of year, as we know, and um, I won't be posting a video every single day for the next month or so, because it, it, there's not much going on. But with this temperature range and day length change coming up towards the end of this month into March, I believe things will start coming into growth. And with quite a few of my plants, the first thing they do is actually bloom rather than grow. So we should start getting buds coming along. So uh, we'll have a go at that. And um, yeah, that'll do for today, I think. Um, Again, thanks for those that have become a member, it's appreciated, and anybody else that's thinking about it, um, depending on what device you're on, <laughs> there should be a join button next to the membership button, and there is a video specifically to for um, iPhone type people who haven't got a join button. The app, the app on iPhone doesn't include it, you've got to go and find it, but there's a video to say how to do that, back a couple. Um, it's something like, let's hunt the join button on iPhones or something like that it's called. But it gives you quite simple instructions to find the join button if you want to. And then thanks again for everybody who subscribed. If you're not, it would be nice if you did so. The subscriber number increasing steadily helps YouTube think of the channel as a positive thing and therefore helps push helps push the adverts over there and all that sort of stuff. So it is important, as the thumbs up is, yeah? And um, thanks again for the buy me a coffee people. There's a few of those popping up every now and again. They're quite a surprise. Because one of the first things I do in the morning is go and check my mail, the, the, you know, the channel mail. 
and you know, so and so's bought you five coffees. Yeah. Ooh, brilliant! <laughs> uh, and then the patrons, thanks for those hanging in there. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it is appreciated. Supporting the channel, like next Saturday when I go to Mathers, they will be selling some plants, hopefully. They're not going to be cheap, you know. And the pot of gold, the contributions from members, patrons, the buy me a coffee, goes towards everything to do with the channel, the kit, maintenance of the kit and replacements, stuff like that and new orchids as and when I get chance and those chances are thin on the ground nowadays so uh, good stuff so thanks a lot and um, thanks for dropping by see you next time bye for now